I will I will start slowly and talk a little bit about Ruth Asawa. Um, you know, I was really not that familiar with her work. I'd seen a few pieces here and there, but uh, this show um, that's at the Whitney is is focused on her drawings rather than her sculpture. There are a few pieces of sculpture in the show, but um, basically it's her drawing process, which she did every day. Um, so uh, one of the things I'd like to say is she is truly <clears throat> a heroic character in my view. Um, having come from, you know, uh, a, a very, you know, modest beginning. Um, it was really a, a small truck farm, a small farm in Southern California um, in the in the early 20s. She was born in, in 26, um, 1926. So her, um, experience as a young child was working on the farm. So she had, um, I believe she had five other siblings. So it was a large family. Um, and they all, they all pitched in and worked the farm. Um, but the, the, the main thing that I, I want to say is, is in a, through a lot of adversity, she really um, fulfilled um, her creative life in a way that's very admirable. And you'll, you'll come to see what, what I, what I mean by that. Ruth Asawa you know, for her drawing served as a center of gravity, the activity she described as the greatest pleasure and the most difficult. Although now widely recognized uh, for her wire sculptures, Asawa drew daily. Her exploratory approach to materials, line, surface, and space yielded an impressive range of drawings that speak to her playful curiosity and technical dexterity, as well as her interest in aesthetic possibilities of the everyday. From her upbringing on her family farm, um, she dreamily traced shapes along dirt roads between shores and attended weekly calligraphy lessons. Drawing became the foundation of her creative life. When her family was forced to leave their home um, and enter the internment camp um, due to the government policy of isolation uh, for um, possible enemy aliens, the Japanese were um, interned as a teenager, Osawa was in a, um, a camp with um, three artists who were who were um, some of the artists with uh, a Disney, and those artists actually taught classes for the for the children in the internment camp and actually for anybody who was in the internment camp who wanted to take the classes. Um, and this really was a turning point for Ruth Asawa. She really um, came to appreciate what, what the art could do in, in her life and um, wanted to share that with others so so in actuality what what ended up happening is she um entered into uh 
Milwaukee Teachers College. And and um, in, I believe it was 1943 um, or 44. And um, was completing her course of study in 1946. Um, and at that time, she was supposed to go um, for her internship in schools and at the time the the powers that be decided that that the um the political climate at the time and the attitudes of the american people were not ready for a japanese teacher uh to work with their children so she was not allowed to do her her uh, internship, um, and several of of the students that were there with her were going to Black Mountain College, and they suggested that she come with them for a summer class, which is what she did. So she entered Black Mountain College, which actually figured in a a very powerful way as a turning point in her life. Um, Black Mountain and throughout the, the six decades of her career, she maintained a belief in the power of art to bring about a better future. Um, uh, this, this really guided her work as an educator, community leader, and artist. Um, the exhibition highlights um, drawing as the through line in Osawa's work, organized thematically, inspired by her uh, inquisitive approach to making art. The presentation comprises more than 100 works. Um, Together, they capture the boundless energy and generous spirit of Osawa, who believed that art is not a series of techniques, but an approach to learning, to questioning, to sharing. So, if you have ever attempted what is called a blind line drawing. Um, it's basically a contour drawing. Um, you'll know the presence of mind that it takes to pull off a drawing like this. Uh, this this drawing of end dive is just one of many. On the on the uh, right hand side, you see a a detail that I. I pulled up out of this drawing. So what the idea is with a blind line contour drawing is that, that you imagine yourself to be touching the edge of the thing that you're drawing with the point of your pencil or pen in this case, and crawling very slowly over the edges not looking at the paper necessarily. I think this drawing is, is somewhere around 18 by 22. Um, but you can see the sensitivity of the line. Now this was this was uh, 1990 when when she when she did this drawing. Let me see if I can actually even come in a little bit closer. Uh, zoom in. So now you can see the sensitivity of that line, every, every nuance of the, the form is something that she's trying to follow. And this is a, this is a practice that she would go back to repeatedly throughout her, the, the entire six decades of her career. Oh, 
Okay. So, um, the family, you know, the six siblings, um, they had this small farm. Uh, um, she attended the bean fields. You see a, a picture of, of uh, Ruth Asawa on the left at 17, and you see her before the trellis beans. Well, she used to do this as a, as a small child, six years old, going out into the fields and, and tying up the, the beans to, to the bean poles. Um, so she was starting this, this, this business of tying, of, of knitting, of, of weaving together even as, as a very young child. And here is um, an early painting by her at, when she was in the internment camp. Um, they used to take, take her out of, of the internment camp to go out and paint landscapes in the area in Arkansas where they were. I hold no hostilities for what happened. I blame no one. Sometimes good comes through adversity. I would not be who I am today had it not been for the internment. And I like who I am. In the summer of 1946, Asawa enrolled in Black Knot College, an experimental liberal arts school in rural North Carolina. Uh, there she studied with avant-garde artists, choreographers, thinkers, including Joseph Alpers, Merce Cunningham, um, Buckminster Fuller, and felt as though another world opened up. Through drawing exercises, she explored the economy of line and honed her hand-eye coordination while carefully observing, while careful observation of ordinary objects around her from leaves and thorns to jello molds and Wonder Bread packaging, offering studies in in color relationships and the play of positive and negative space. Albert's coursework in color um, painting and design proved particularly influential. Asawa credited the Bauhaus artist and educator, not only for teaching her how to draw, but how to see. She took his classes multiple times, returning to certain exercises and forms. The repetition determined the cyclical rhythm of her lifelong art practice. And many of the techniques and motifs seen here reappear throughout the exhibition. So you see basically this, this color study on, on the left, um, the, the, the play with transparencies, the positive and negative shapes, the interaction of color um, is very sensitive. Um, one of the things that that Albers is is known for is a book called the the interaction interaction of color, and um, you know basically. The concept of it is colors change in different contexts. So if you take one color and put it on another color and take the same color and put it on a different color, those color, the, that same color is going to look different in relationship to what's around it. Um, that's a simplified version, and I'll show you examples of it. Okay. So when she when Ruth first went to Black Mountain, she wanted to study with Annie Albers, Joseph Albers' wife. Um, she knew she knew of her work, of her of her weaving, 
and really wanted to study that. She had gone to Mexico as a student from the um, Milwaukee um, Teachers College one summer and studied folk, folk craft in Mexico for that summer and really wanted to study that with, with Annie Albers. But uh, Annie Albers said, it takes too long to learn to weave. You cannot do it in one summer. I recommend that you take a class with my husband. And so she did. <laughs> And this is, okay, if we look here, the red meander, this is a Greek, this Greek form. Um, uh, it, it basically can be waves or it can be, it can be this kind of, of um, uh, maze-like pattern. Um, and here is Ruth Asawa's version of the meander. Uh, which she did as an exercise in in one of uh, Joseph Albert's classes. This is cut paper. Um, let's see. I want to move this. Okay. Um, it it's a little hard to see on screen, but if you if you stare at the 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 area in the 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 shape in the lower right hand uh area of the screen uh, on this on this image the orange and the green and if you stare at it for a while you'll start to see that the the green that's inside the orange seems a little different from the green that's outside the orange edging up on the brown you can almost see that 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 the green that's edging up on the brown is a little bit lighter on the edge and the green that's inside the orange is richer, more intense green. They are the same color. A lot of this is, is easier to see when you see the painting in person, but um, this is the idea uh, of, of contextual color. And here is um, Joseph Alpers work. And um, instead of art, I have taught philosophy. Though technique for me is a big word, I never have taught how to paint. All my, all my doing, was to make people see. Abstraction is real, probably more real than nature. <laughs> so these are some um, early examples of, of um, Albert's work. The, the piece on the... Um, the lower right, actually, he spent a lot of time in in Mexico, and and this is actually drawn from the um, the monuments, the 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 temples in in Mexico. These shapes were drawn from that. Okay, and this is. Back to Ruth Asawa, working on again on this contextual color issue. Um, so, learning to see, um, you know. I think what I'm going to do is um, talk a little bit more about Albers. Um, you know, he, uh, they were actually the head. Um, Albers was the, one of the heads of the Bauhaus 
Annie Albers and Joseph Albers both worked there. It was a very collaborative atmosphere, a very progressive school in Germany. It was um, uh, really a vast knowledge um, concentrated in one place that there were there were fabulous teachers there. Paul Clay was there. Kandinsky taught there. Um, uh, there were uh, architects, Gropius and, and um, a number of other architects worked through it. It was a, a combination of, of, of architecture, painting, design, um, applied and and um, and fine arts. Um, and so this is what Albers brought to the the situation at Black Mountain. So Ruth Asawa was trying to, work with the 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 projects that that were that were set out in Joseph Albers class and again you can see you know the play of of this set of blues against the set of 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 orange to yellow um and the activity the positive and negative spaces the shapes the interaction between them and the interaction between the colors. And again, um, this is, there's, there's the transparency um, in this, there's, there's the form, color and tone. Um, the figure ground relationship between the shapes on the inside of the three and the outside of the three and the shapes between the S's and the and the threes and the shift in direction in these things, you know, this all activates the composition. There's also the transparencies where the the threes overlap and you see that different that color change that's happening inside of there. Repetition, scale, and transparency. So, I studied drawing and painting, and we were encouraged to use whatever we could find. Since we didn't have anything to work with, we worked with leaves, which were plentiful in North Carolina the wild leaves the dogwood leaves turned brilliant red when the frost came um so i've i've laid out a lot of things on on this page and and if you notice this this um large leaf form is from the 1990s so she came back to this you know this is a large scale piece it's 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 43 by 26 um so the themes that she that she came in contact with at black mountain she continued to come back to and re-examine throughout her career and brought them further along. Okay, so again, something as simple as a potato print, um, she would use this as the as the matrix to explore color. So I did I took out a couple of close-ups and put them on screen for you to see. Um, And so she would use um, 
you know, potato prints or pork or fish rubbings or rubber stamps, apples, leaves, wood, and use it in repetition and variation to, to create the composition. And, and um, you can see this kind of grid-like pattern that, that begins to emerge. Um, Many of the minimalists from the '60s. Now, this is this is you know basically these were back in the in the uh, the late '40s when she was doing these pieces. So this was very innovative stuff in a certain way. Uh, there were there were other really very famous students like. Uh, Robert Rauschenberg and Cy Twombly, who were there at the same time as she was there. Um, Willem de Kooning and Elaine de Kooning were there, and they taught at, at Black Mountain. So the exposure that she had to contemporary artists at, at, at that time, um, uh, the, some of the leading poets of the time, um, uh, Gregory Corso and... Um, I believe um, Duncan was there. Um, there, there were great, there was great exposure. There were also at the same time um, architecture students and um, uh, dance. Um, all of this was happening. All of it was, yeah, and they were taking biology classes and literature classes and and um uh mathematics so that it was a very rounded exposure that they were getting there um so close observation hand eye coordination You can see the sensitivity of 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 these of the line in in these pieces. It's not about accurate anatomy, but about the sensitivity to what she's observing. And here's here's a, a picture of Joseph Albers uh, teaching at Black Mountain, and you notice the the yin yang. Uh, symbol on the blackboard. I mean, basically, this this business of the figure ground. Um, Albers was a very rigorous teacher. He was very demanding of his students, and and uh, that really suited Ruth the Sowell well, since she was a very tenacious um, student and tenacious artist. Now, um, here, here is, this is all done freehand. This is a Anasawa drawing um, of, of two uh, headlights in the fog. Uh, and notice down in the right-hand corner, there's a dragonfly. Um, you know, basically, I mean, this is a, a remarkable drawing, given the fact that she wasn't using any any kind of a tool to make these straight lines other than her eye. She was really going point to point to create these, these linear elements and the circular elements. It's, it is really an amazing piece. It's not gigantic, it's 16 by 23 inches, but wow. <laughs> okay. And one of the other projects that, that Albers had them practice at Black Mountain was folding paper. Um, and um, she continued that practice. Uh, it, it really, she learned origami as a child and she continued to practice 
it in in different forms on a larger scale. Um, and this is a shot that I took on the right. Is a shot that I took in the in the um, exhibition when I saw that lady's dress. I just said, "Wait a minute." <laughs> <laughs> Asawa's walking around this place. Um, and I took a side view of one of of one of the pieces so that you could see how the 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 actual um folds interact with the black and the white. Very interesting stuff. Okay. And um oh let's yeah, origami plays an important role in the optics and dimensionality. Um, this large rhythmic drawing um, brings to mind another innovative teacher at Black Mountain, the composer, John Cage. With John Cage, well, his, one, of his, one of his books is called Silence. Silence in music is the equivalent of negative space in visual art. The pause between sounds can be as important as the tone. Silence is the negative space in music. And so you see the space around these chairs being drawn. Again, very rhythmic. You know, if you look at you look at the the kind of patterning that's happening, that's that's being kind of indicated by the edges, the contours of the chairs. It's really fascinating. It's a large drawing too. It's forty two by sixty inches. Okay, Annie Alvarez and student Alex Reed created hardware jewelry, demonstrating that hierarchies do not exist among materials. In the summer of 1947 in Mexico, Asawa became intrigued by the looped wire baskets used to hold eggs in the market. This simple form constructed from a common utilitarian material was the catalyst for the creation of Osawa's elegant wire sculptures. Simple wire baskets evolved into more complex forms as she realized the capacity of the looped wire structure to support weight and retain form. Asawa visited Mexico in 1945 when she took a class at, um, with the designer Clara Corset, studying Mexican functional crafts. She returned in 47 as a volunteer with the Quakers uh, American Friends Service Committee, and at this time met craftspeople I'm not even going to try and pronounce the Mexican uh, city that she that she visited. Um, they taught her how to wire egg baskets, how to make wire egg baskets. Uh, the smaller of the two baskets seen here was created with thinner wire and was easier to manipulate and is likely to be an early, earlier version of the wire baskets, which um, she would become known for. Um, the larger basket is more rigid. Its form um, uses a higher, a higher gauge copper wire. Anyway, um, you can see the copper wire starting to, um, you know, the there's that vertigree that starts to happen with copper. Um, and this is the, this is the the beginning point of what would become a, a, a major part of her, of the body of her work. Okay, so um, she 
she took classes with with Merce Cunningham, um, and and this really um, affected her. Um, Cunningham's um, uh, dance movements are very abstract, um, just as silences are intrinsic to um, music, space between bodies in dance are essential. Cunningham's movement and freeze sculpture like freezes exemplify the idea. It's about abstract form between bodies as much as movement. For the most part, Cunningham's work is non-narrative, although there are some rather bird-like references, but it ain't no Swan Lake. So what you can see here is is the shapes, you know, this the shapes between these these rounded forms, um, and this is a correlation in inside um, Asawa's mind to that sense of spaces between dancers, between movements, um, these biomorphic shapes are indication of dancers. And here again, um, bodies are like baskets. Um, we are containers. Uh, the wire sculpture becomes closed yet transparent. Um, they take up volume yet they're open. So if you look at the positive and negative shapes again in this in this painting that's here, you know, they kind of come in and out of focus that sometimes some hover forward, others others float back. Um, the darks kind of come forward at times and and sink into the distance. Um, these disks change form. This is the beginning of something which is going to be expanded upon. Okay. Asawa was a student at Black Mountain. She developed this intricate method of crocheting metal wire, the spherical and organic forms. Um, the sculpture's take was uh, was to define a portion of her sculptural work throughout her career. This emerged while she was a student at Black Mountain College. Um, the series of earlier paintings completed during her time at the college depicted those amorphous sphere, spheres one of the key influences on her sculptural practice was the experience of taking dance classes with choreographer and dancer Merce Cunningham. And there's Merce on the left. Now, one of the other things that I want to talk about now is the universality of what this form is all about. Um, okay, I'm going to go back. Wait a minute. Don't want to go here yet. Okay, so basically what's happening here is there is a metamorphosis that happens between two cells when they are duplicating themselves. Um, it's a twinning that happens. And that, that shape that you're seeing in, in, this, in this sculpture is actually something which she saw in her biography, bi biology class, biography class, biology class, the, the, the mitosis, the, the, the re, the twinning of cells until they separate and become separate cells and, and duplicate themselves yet again. So this is, about the cellular multiplication. Um, 
And one of the things that she was interested in was the makeup of our being on the cellular level, the, the, the similarity of, of, of each human being. We are made up of cells. We are more alike than we are different. And this is, this is something which would come back again over and over again in her work. Um, she came to consider herself not a Japanese American, not an American, but a human who made art. Um, and she wanted to bring that to, to, to others. Um, now this experience, oh, wait a minute, here we go. Um, this this was from a dance piece that she that she created um in in uh actually she did the sets for um for the for dancers in San Francisco in 1989 um so those folds continue to unfold um there's also this business of the of the double helix involved in this so there's this dna business that's starting to be played out in by this time ah okay um so this is buckminster fuller who was also there and very influential on 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 osawa um when i'm working on a problem i never think about beauty I think about how to solve the problem. But when I finished, if the solution is not beautiful, I know it's wrong. That was Buckminster Fuller. And you you see again um, on on the left, this kind of cellular structure that that Asal is beginning to to um, play out. When she's back at, at Black Mountain, this is 1969. Um, so she's carried it further. And here is the lady herself. Now, one of the things that happened at, at Black Mountain is um, she met and as soon as 1949 and the laws would allow it, allow interracial couples to marry she married um i can't remember what his first name is lanier is his last name and he's a sculptor uh, i mean uh, uh an architect um and they had six children together um but you can see here the this cellular form this these different variations on the cellular form in in the sculpture and in these drawings um you know bucky's observation of nature was something which which really how he thought about it was something which influenced her um very elegant structures the duplication of cells, the multiplication. Okay. And here again, this is um, uh, one of Osawa's uh, um, studios. And, and on, the, on the right is Noguchi's studio on McDougal Street. Um, they both ran into fairly intense racial prejudice. Um, they were pigeonholed as 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 Asian, as Japanese. Um, Noguchi was was kind of accused of of being feminine in his art form. This is in the fifties and sixties. The critics were, you know, very macho and into the whole abstract expressionist machismo. Um, 
you know, nothing could be further from the truth with 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 Osawa, her although there was the calligraphy and there was the 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 understanding of 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 certain aspects of Japanese art. It was more about Mexican and drawing from from folk art culture to create these pieces. Um, and again, you know, um, the differences, the similarities and differences between Noguchi and 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 Asawa are interesting. The organic forms and the and the the. Um, there is a a certain use of positive and negative space in their work, which is very elegant and very cultivated culturally. They were very different. The um, Osawa had early recognition. She had shows in New York City in the in the late fifties and early sixties, but. Having six children made it rather difficult for her to maintain a, a exhibition career in New York City, along with living in San Francisco. Whereas Noguchi was um, married for six years, but never committed to that marriage and and really pursued an international career. Um, both of them were profoundly affected and and um, influenced by Bucky. Uh, Noguchi worked with Buckminster Fuller designing a, a, an automobile and designing um, uh, different types of 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 apparatus that that Buckminster Fuller came up with in in his in his laboratory um and Asawa just appreciated the structure and the the sense of 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 relationship trying to trying to use nature as a as a as a jumping off point as a model for for her work so Again, Osawa. Osawa, this is this is uh, her in her home studio, surrounded by her children. She would she would work, you know, while they were there. She would work, you know. She would um, make them breakfast and then clear off the table, and that would become her studio. Um, and if somebody needed a sandwich, needed a sandwich, she would stop what she was doing and make the sandwich, and then go back to work. Um, her work ethic was always so powerful. Um, her commitment to to um, to teaching, to working with with underprivileged children and and her belief that art could change people's lives as it had changed hers was something that she maintained also and that is a major difference between her and and uh uh Noguchi um and here she is working with children um it's really a lifelong commitment to art in school. She would she would become part of the the San Francisco Art Commission and lobby for funding for um, uh, art in schools and workshops. And actually, there is a school that had been created with her name now in San Francisco and it's still functioning. Um, there is a universality that she is after in this work, and she believes that this is something which can bring humanity together. We need this more than ever. Uh, here's a tie wire sculpture drawing. Um, very complex, really wonderful. You can get lost in these, and I recommend that you go and see the show and get lost in them, <laughs> as I did. Uh, 
it's just wonderful. The layering, the complexity of these things, it's just amazing. And here is the physical manifestation of one of those sculptures. So what she did was take hundreds and hundreds of these wires and twist them together into a bigger knot and then un unfold them into these branches as they went out and, and more and more wires loosening up. And the quality of the shadow as much as the sculpture is something which is, is always shimmering in her work. Um, the, the, the full sculptures have that same quality. The shadows cast on the walls from them are really amazing. And the way they move with the air as people walk through the room. Fabulous, inventive. And here she is. They're very meditative pieces. Okay. The faces of Ruth Asawa from uh, the mid 60s through 2000, Asawa created hundreds of individual masks out of clay. This wall of 233 th masks became a permanent part of the Cantor collection uh, represents all races. So this is, again, one of those themes that, that she goes back to, you know, having experienced this, this sense of, of isolation, of, of separation, she set out on a lifelong journey to try and understand how, how to how to heal that sense of separation. And anything that came into the house was subject matter. Albert's bouquet, one of her children brought, brought this bouquet to her. wonderful drawings in this show you've got to see it it they her presence in these pieces the 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 way she would place these blocks and create um out of nothing and here's one of her public art projects in san francisco it's a it's a fountain um I believe this was this was not her first. Um, this was in 73. Her first was back in the late 60s, which is here. On the right is uh the mermaid fountain at Girardelli Square, uh, which was created in 1969. And on on the left is one of her origami fountains. Um makes a lovely sound. Okay. And we're coming to the end. Um, there is a book out by uh, Marilyn Chase, um, Everything She Touched, The Life of Ruth Asawa. It is a, she, she's she got a YouTube um, also by the same name. I recommend you watch it. She is not a, a um, an art scholar, but she is um, somebody who has done a lot of research, was given access to endless boxes. Osawa drew every day. So there are boxes and boxes of her writings and her and her drawings, and she was given access to all of it, old photographs, every all kinds of memorabilia. So she has put together a really touching talk on 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 Osawa. Um, 
and um, Ruth Asawa radical universalism is uh, based on a talk that was done by a hmm, post grad student who who actually did a talk and definitely worth watching. It's a wonderful talk, and he really gets into this business of the cellular um, uh, business in Osawa's work and what that's really about and what that was about for her. Um, and I am going to keep on going here. Let's see. If you have any questions, please ask now because we're going to be ending soon. I threw on a few more um, uh, pages out of her notebooks just because I love them. <laughs> uh. Fabulous. You know, th there were some landscapes and seascapes. I couldn't put it all in and, and you know, basically deal with it. But uh, this is this is the story. It's it's just gorgeous stuff. I mean, you know, look at the color in that in that piece on the left. I love her stuff. Okay, so uh, there is a gigantic um, American Impressionist show that is taking place at the National Arts Club. I believe is the name of the place. Anyway, I am going to do that at the end of the month. Um, it It is just an amazing array of artists from the 18, um, I think they start in the 1860s and work their way all the way up to um, um the 1920s, I think, or even the 1940s. Um, some of them fit awkwardly into the uh, into the name American Impressionist, but we'll 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 look at it anyway. It look, it looks like it's a big, wonderful show. And so I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thank you for coming. <laughs>